Ecclesiastes chapter 8 in your Bibles, and uh, we're going to be talking tonight about time and judgment. It is uh, coming near to the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. Of course, there's 12 chapters, but uh, it seems like you can pretty much cover one chapter for, for a subject that we, we go over. So, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, time and judgment. Time and judgment. I want to begin to read in verse 1, a short little chapter within your Bible. He says, Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment, and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Where the word of a king is, there is power, and who may say unto him, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Because every purpose there is a time and judgment, therefore the misery of a man is great upon him. For he knoweth not that which shall be, for who can tell him when it shall be? There is no man that hath power over the spirit to retain the spirit, Neither hath he power in the day of death, and there is no discharge in the war. Neither shall w- wickedness deliver those that are given to it. All this have I seen and applied my heart unto every work that is done under the sun. There is a time when one man ruleth over another to his own hurt, and so I saw the wicked buried, and who had come and gone to the place of the holy, and they were forgotten in the city where they had done so done. This is also vanity." Because sins against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it should be well with them that fear God, which fear before Him. But it should not be well with the wicked, neither shall he prolong his days, which are as a shadow, because he feareth not before God. There is a vanity which is done under upon which is done upon the earth, that there be just men unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. I said this that this is also vanity. Then I commended birth, because a man had hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and to be merry. For that shall abide with him of his labor the days of his life, which God giveth him under the sun. And when I apply my heart to know wisdom and to see business that is done upon the earth, for also there is that neither day nor night seeth sleep with his eyes. Then I beheld all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. Because though a man labor to seek it out, yet he shall not find it, yea, Further, though a wise man think to know it, yet shall he not be able to find it. He shall not be able to find it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're thankful for the day that you've given to us. And we, we had a great service this morning, really enjoyed it. Lord, it's a privilege to be able to preach your word. But Lord, I just pray that you would just guide us and give us wisdom, give us understanding, Lord. Help us to discern both time and judgment as the, 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 your instruction gives us within your word. I pray you give us uh, understanding hearts, Lord, and help us to walk uh, nearer, closer to you, Lord. Thank you so much for the life that you've given us, Lord, to enjoy, as uh, Solomon says, under the sun. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The devil and his cohorts, they were working together trying to discern what they can do to try to keep people from receiving the gospel. And And many of them were coming together and they had all sorts of ideas and one of them stood up and they said, I know what we can do to try to keep people from getting saved, to keep them from hearing the gospel and receiving Christ as their Savior. I'll tell you what we can do. We can tell them that there is no God. Well, the devil, he thought to himself, there was kind of silence within his room. He says, you know what, that's probably not a good idea. You know, everybody under the sun, there's probably a lot of people that that, that think, well, there is a supernatural being, there is a supreme being, and and people have these beliefs, and I don't really think that it's a bad idea because one day I want to be set up as God, to be worshipped as God. I don't think we ought to go through with that plan. Uh, Well, they came up with a couple other plans where they said, well, you know what, I'll tell you what, 
We'll, we'll see that there's no such thing as hell, and people ought not to be worried about hell, and we'll just get rid of this notion altogether. Well, the devil said, well, I, I really don't think we'll go along with that plan. Well, after a while, they, they've concluded, come close to the conclusion of their, their appointment, their, their congregational meeting here. They said, well, I'll tell you what this will do. He says, uh, what we'll do is we'll, we're not going to worry about telling them there is no God. We're not worry about telling them that there is no hell. They can believe that if they want to. What we're going to do is tell them they have all the time in the world under the sun. Do not worry about salvation. Do not worry about God. Do not worry about these things because, hey, we'll just convince them if, if they accept God as their Savior. Hey, you want to have to change your whole life around. You want to change everything about you. And so you, you can just put that off until the last moment of your life and, and not worry about it. Wait till your very last dying breath and then you can accept the gospel and accept God because by that point, it's pretty much almost too late, isn't it? And I believe that's the number one trick of the devil is to think that we have all the time within the world uh, to accept the Lord as our Savior and just keep putting it off and putting it off and, and just putting it far from our mind, not worrying about the judgments to come. And here Solomon brings before our mind that, that we have time and judgment. It's not promised. We don't have tomorrow. And we never know when the judgment is going to come. We know within the Scriptures, First Timothy chapter 4, it says this. He says that in the latter days... Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Kind of sounds like today, doesn't it? He says over in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he goes on and, and continues on with a list like this. He says, uh, Perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, to be unthankful and holy, without natural affection, truce breakers, despisers of those that are good, they're heedy, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of self. They have a form of godliness, and we can see that in many churches that, that don't give the gospel have a form of godliness but they deny the power thereof and it's amazing that how well that explains our time and the apostle paul says of such a the people who are like this turn away from them jesus he gives us this instruction in matthew chapter 16 verses 2 through 3 he says when it is evening you say it's going to be fair weather. You, you look up in the sky, you see the signs that, that are going on. You can look up and you can tell when it's raining. You can tell when it's going to be uh, a cold day. I mean, you can tell all kinds of things by looking at the skies, but you guys can't discern that the time of the Lord, your day is drawing near, it's coming to an end. And you, you're not ready. You can't discern the times. Uh, I didn't quote that exactly right, but he says, When it's evening, you say it'll be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it'll be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, you cannot discern the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? Wisdom, Solomon says, is being able to discern both times and judgment there in verse 5. And what you do and how you prepare against the day when you meet God is vitally important. It's not missing a light bill. You know, some people think that's the end of the world, don't they? It's not missing a day of work. It's not something just as uh, trivial as missing something small such as that. But here Solomon is trying to uh, inform those who are his hearers, those in his congregation saying, hey, you don't want to miss the judgment that's coming. You want to be prepared for this. You want to be prepared for... Uh, the coming day where you want to meet your Lord, you don't know if it's tomorrow, you don't know if it's the next day. And in doing so, and trying to, for Solomon, trying to try to reach these guys, because he's the one who got wrapped up in the sin and got wrapped up in the trouble. He's seen the end of his time, that it wasn't exactly as God had laid it out, as I discussed this morning. God had a better plan for Solomon, but he didn't meet it. And so he, 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 he's trying to reason with those who, who may not understand, hey, there's a higher power than the powers that be here on this earth. And he tries to bring them to an understanding, hey, you know, just as you see a king on this earth and you want to keep his commandments, you want to do exactly what he says, and if you don't do what he says, uh, there's going to be some repercussions. There's the executioner of judgment, if I could say it that way. I mean, if you disobey the laws, there's consequences to it. 
And just like we see it here this, on this earth, as we see that there's consequences to breaking the, our governmental laws, there's consequences to breaking God's laws, and I believe this is what Solomon is trying to show us. Hey, we need to have discernment. We need to be wise concerning our time. We need to be wise concerning judgment. And you know what? Even if we're saved, we still got to be wise concerning the times. Because you know what? It says to walk circumspectly. He says to redeem the time for the days are evil. There's many things that he says concerning time that's not only applied just to the lost person, but is applied to us as well. We need to be ready because the times are coming, drawing to a close. You know, I look at the the news, I look at and see everything that's going on, and, and, and like I said within the Scriptures, looking at First Timothy 4, looking at Second Timothy 3, looking at all the other Scriptures, we can see it won't be long before my Lord is coming. It won't be long before the rapture. It won't be long before God judges this earth. It won't be long before the tribulation. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. We must be wise in discerning both time and judgment and be ready to meet our God. So here, the first of all, I believe we see the king's commandment. Is there's a, a class of wise men. He says in the very first, in the very first verse, he says, Who is as the wise man, and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A wise a man's wisdom maketh his face to shine, and the boldness of his face shall be changed. And so he begins to look at it, and he asks you, Well, well what does it take to be a wise man? What, what should, how should I describe a wise man? And in the essence of that one question describes the whole rest of the, the, the chapter here as he gives it to us. The wise man is the one who understands that there's a commandment we ought to keep. The wise man is the one who understands that there's a king that's greater than the king that's on this earth. A wise man is the one who understands, hey, I've got to walk carefully while I'm on this earth. A wise man understands that he's got to answer unto God one day and he doesn't know when his last day is going to be. Who is a wise man? And this wise man is going to... What's the wisdom that he takes on the inside is going to affect the outside. You know, think about uh, uh, Psalms there. What does it say about the, uh, a man who's blessed? He, he walks in the laws of the Lord and it's his delight. He delights in the law of the Lord, does he not? He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, leaf also not weather. He'll bring forth his fruit. And, and see, that, that's how he describes a wise man. He's a blessed man. And so here he wants his readers to understand. Uh, and he's, he's drawing a parallel between the human government and God's government. That's what I see. He can't counsels them first of all. In order to be a wise man, you've got to understand that there's an obligation. You're obligated to the laws of the land just like you're obligated to the laws of God. If you want to be wise, the first line of counsel is to keep the king's commandments, is it not? That's what he says in verse 2. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment and that in regard to the oath of God. A king is one who has dominion. He has power. He has... I mean, he exercises government there in the kingdom. God, God is the one who gives. He's the one that grants the ability. Jesus says unto Pilate, you know, you don't have power to put me on this cross except for it were given to you of God. Uh, I believe it's the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans that every power to be is ordained of God. And this is what Solomon is pointing out. Hey, there's a king. We ought to keep his commandments. This, command, this, this king has a kingdom, and the kingdom was given to him by God. This is what Nebuchadnezzar had to learn. But there's a, he's a king, he has a kingdom, and it, there's an operation of government that's underneath of it. Now, you remember that early on in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon was talking about oppression. He was talking about trouble. He's talking about... Those who have been wronged, those who have been hurt, and they, they, they're thinking to themselves, well, what do you want to do about all this wrong, all this chaos, all this uh, injustice that's going on in this world? Well, there's an answer to it. It's the human government. When the human government doesn't do what they're supposed to do, there's a higher power. God will take care of it. Now, I'll, I'll mention that later on. But here Solomon shows us God's way of dealing with the injustices on this earth is through human government. It's an imperfect institution. I mean, it doesn't take a genius to figure that out. You look at the court systems, you look at the laws, you look at what's going on in the politics, you, you can see that it's because man's uh, the one who's trying to work it all out. And much of the time it seems like, well, uh, I'll just say this, it's just 
without God working in the heart of an individual, it's kind of hard to have a good government, is it not? But God here is given an institution to, to be able to deal with the injustices in this world and He's ordained this government that's been set up. And the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 13, verses 1-5, through 5, he says, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that are ordained of God, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation, for rulers are not a terror to good works, to but, but to what? But to evil. But thou then be afraid of the power, do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same, for he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do not that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, a revenger, to execute wrath upon them that doeth evil. Therefore, you must be subject, must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but for conscience sake. We, we see that going on over at Savannah's house right now. And I'm glad for that. The function of human government is to protect its citizens, is to punish the criminals, and is to promote the welfare of, of the citizens that are under it. That's what it's all about. Is there, I mean, to protect our citizens, to punish the evildoers, to promote our welfare so we can go about and we can live peacefully, we can live safely, and and, and, and it ought to ideally ought to be, I mean, we ought not to have anything to worry about, but we do, don't we? And our part on the other end is, uh, and I believe this to be true, is because the Scriptures say we ought to pray for those in authority. We ought to pay tribute unto Caesar, is what the Bible says, and then to participate. I mean, we ought to be out voting. We ought to be involved. We ought to submit ourselves unto the ordinance uh, there. And I believe this is what Solomon is pointing out. The only reason for us to be excused from being under this responsibility is what? As if it violates the laws of God, because there's a higher being than, than than the laws of the land. And if the laws of the land contradict the laws of God, well, what are you going to do? Well, you ought to obey God rather than man. I mean, it's, it's what, will there be consequences for it? Oh, I'm sure. I mean, there are those who go out and they preach against homosexuality, they preach against something that steps on somebody's toes. I mean, they get all upset, they try to change the laws, they begin to throw people into prison. I mean, it, it could happen. But he tells us there's a higher being, there's one that we ought to be more concerned about, we ought to be more concerned about violating the laws of God than the laws of man. And so when it comes between the two, our, our obligation, and, and we, we see it over and over again in the book of Daniel and the book of Acts. What happens when, they, when, they're brought in, when, when Daniel and his friends are brought into the, the, the king's palace, Nebuchadnezzar's palace, and they present before him the meats, and he said, well, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to defile myself with the king's meat or with the king's wine. And they, they said, we're not going to do it. Why? Because God is the higher power. When they asked uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to bow down before the golden image, they said, we're not going to do it because the laws of God says, you know, that we should not have any graven image. We shouldn't worship anybody but God. And they choose to obey God rather than man. We see it in the book of Acts where they tell Peter, they say, Peter and John, you need to stop preaching. Against, you, you want to stop preaching Jesus Christ. You want to stop preaching His name. You want to stop talking about this resurrection from the dead. You need to stop all this. They didn't have, I mean, the only thing they could do was threaten them. I mean, they couldn't do anything else. Why? Because of the power of their message. And they said, well, we'll obey God. That's what we want to do. If you don't like it, that's fine. You can do what you want to with me, but I want to keep on preaching. I want to keep on carrying on. The Apostle Paul thrown into prison many times, but did he stop preaching? Oh, no, he kept on going. He kept on preaching, kept on proclaiming. The other reason is uh, for not obeying the law would be to remove ourselves from under the domain of giving government. I, I say this because I say because of this. You know, we we see all this nonsense going on not only in Facebook, not only in the news, not only in other realms where somebody gets up and they they say, well, uh, like I, I'm sure you heard about it. People apologizing. Oh. Uh, when they took out the, the Iran's uh, what, what their leader or whatever, 
And they say, oh, we, we apologize. You know, we, we don't believe in this. And, you know, uh, we're, we're so sorry. Well, you, and you hear all these guys saying, well, if you don't like it, you know, you can go and join Iran if you want to. You can go follow underneath the Lord. You can remove yourself from the laws that protect you here within this land. And, and you can go over there if you want to. But I tell you what, you need to respect the laws of this land. And that's the other reason, you know, if you don't want to abide by the laws here in America, and if you don't want to submit to the king here in America, we don't have a king, we have a president, and I'll, I'll make that clear. If you, don't, if you don't want to submit to it, I mean, there's other places that you can go. You don't have to live here. You don't have to enjoy the privileges. You don't have to enjoy the things that you do here, the freedom of religion, the freedom of speech. You can go somewhere else if you want to. But here Solomon saying, if you want to, uh, talk about kings and all this other thing. A wise man is going to obligate him. He's going to put himself underneath. He's going to submit himself there to the government. I'm not saying that I agree with everything that goes on. You know, not not. You can ask everybody in this whole governmental system, and not everybody agrees with hundred percent with everything that goes on. But I tell you what, I'll respect the rules. I'll respect the government. I love my country. I mean, me, Brother Willis, and several others of you here has fought for our country. And we'll continue to fight for it because we love it. But here we're, we're to submit ourselves under it and we're to obey the king's command uh, so much as it doesn't violate the, the laws of God. And Jesus says, Fear not them which kill the body but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear Him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He says that in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. The Bible hasn't changed, uh, hasn't changed that the beginning of wisdom begins with the fear of God. It says that over and over again throughout Proverbs. The beginning of wisdom, it always starts with the fear of God, and that's who we obey first of all. So the first step in being wise is to recognize our obligation. The next step is to see the king's authorization to exercise his power. Verses 3 and 4, look at it. He says, Be not hasty to go out of his sight, and stand not in the evil thing, for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Pleaseth him. Where the word of a king is, there is what? Power. And who may say unto him, what to us? You know what? I don't like your laws. I don't like your government. You know, why are you doing this to me? He says he has power to do what he's doing. It's been given to him of God. And so the ruler has power. He has authority. He has authorization to enforce the laws of the land. We don't have a king here. Again, you know, we have a president. We have checks and balances in our governmental system. But whatever laws are in the land, we're expected to obey them. And guess what? If you break the speed limits, they didn't ask you if you knew it or not, you're still punishable by them. If you break any laws whatsoever they are, if you broke them, I mean, you can say all you want to, well, I didn't know, or, you know, you can ignore them or whatever the case may be, but you're still punishable. You have every right to punish those. Paul says again, But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. And I'll grant you sometimes that bad guys get away, and it doesn't seem like the system is always fair. I, I grant you that. You can look around and say, Why is no one doing something about this or that or the other? And You know, you talk about the drug dealers, the thieves, the scammers, and... All that getting away with their actions. You know, we got a prayer letter in the mail last week. And uh, Brother Elwood Hurst, he sent in a prayer letter into the mail. And I, I love the brother. I'm glad that one day he came into the Wednesday night meeting and was able to spend time with him, talk to him a little bit. And been serving out in Papua New Guinea for many years. And, and, and faithful brother in Christ. I mean, he's taking care of his wife. We've been praying for Miss Doors for her dementia and all of this. But... He got a letter in the mail. It's back there on the back wall. And, you know, during the Christmas season, somehow or another, one of the scammers got him. I don't know whether it was through the phone or through, probably through the Internet, because usually that's the way it always is. They, they got a hold of all of his bank account information and took all of his money away from him. 
And we think to ourselves, well, how in the world can anybody do that to a faithful ministry? How can anybody do this? It seems unjust. And, and what are they going to do about it? What chances are that anybody could tell you when it comes to this sort of thing, they're, they're hard to catch. When it comes to technology and these things, they got the FBI working on it, and they got several other local officials working on it, but, you know, it's kind of hard to catch. And sometimes we think to ourselves, well, well it's not fair, it shouldn't be, and, and, and what are we going to do about it? Well, there's, there is something we can do about it. When, man's, when man can't do anything about it, there is one who can do something about it because the Lord says there in Romans chapter 12, verses 17, 18, 19, somewhere within there, and you can look it up. He says, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. That's what he says. And you know, when we, when we look at situations and we say, well, where, what in the world are we going to do? It doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem just. And, and, and somebody ought to do something about this. Well, we can appeal unto God and God will deal with it. You know, I'd rather be uh, left to the hands of man than the hands of God any day. But God, God will deal with them. Got to deal with them. You know, He has ways of dealing with things beyond our comprehension and beyond our knowledge. And, and like I said, we need to be praying for Brother Elwood Hurst and, and you know, falling victim to this thing. But God executes judgment in these cases. Solomon says, a wise man, he sees his obligation to the government. He understands the power given to execute judgment and justice. And he stays within the confines of the law. On top of that, he finds protection in the government. The person that keeps the law, he dwells safely in the land. You know, he don't have to worry about anything. He, he's obeying the law. He's keeping the laws. Nobody's going to show up at his door. He's protected by the law. And this is the reason why uh, I know that it's talking about human government. Because we can't keep the commandments of God. And we can try and we can try and we can work hard at it, but... Uh, you and I know, we've all been here, we've all accepted Christ as our Savior because I know your testimonies. There's no way that we could do it. And so the only thing that he could be talking about here is uh, uh, the, the higher, or not the higher powers to be, but the, the local government here. And he says, the best thing that we can do is keep the law. And if we keep the law of the land, well, there's protection in keeping the law uh, of the land. We have nothing to fear for law abiders. Here Solomon is continuing to build his case as he draws the parallels between man's government on earth and God's government in heaven. And as a king who went astray from the ordinance of commands of God, as a king who had seen the repercussions of his actions, as a king who had had, had it all and he felt empty, and Solomon understood that there was a greater law, the law of God. He sees carnal fallen man that man has not enough sense to flee to Jesus for refuge for their souls. They've offended a holy God and judgment is coming. So we see in verse uh, 11. Verse 11, it says, Because sins against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. And so they say, well, I'm not judged today. I'm not judged tomorrow. I'm not judged the next day. And I just want to keep it up until somebody does something about it. I dare somebody. I've, I've seen this happen in school systems and other places where they just keep defying it and defying it and dividing it and just dare somebody to throw them out of, out of the school. I've seen them do it and just as a regular citizen, I've seen them do it. And it's this sort of mindset where, where a doctor comes up to somebody who has a smoking problem and he says, you want to know what? You know, if you don't stop this smoking, it's going to kill you. And you know what they do? They just light up another one. They just keep smoking and smoking another one and smoking another one and they think, well, it hasn't killed me yet. But it's going to happen. Same way with the drinking, same way with anything else we could bring up. But they think, well, well, I didn't die today, I didn't die the next day, and, and I think it's all forced, and I just want to keep living the way that I want to. That's, that's their mindset. I see that this is a reason in Ecclesiastes 11.9 because of the uh, uh, youth. I'm talking about people such as myself or younger. Ecclesiastes 11.9 says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, 
And in the sight of nine eyes, this is their philosophy, this is their mindset. I just want to keep on keeping on. And he says, but know thou, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee in the judgment. That's why the Bible said that there's pleasure in sin for a season. The devil is blind to the minds of them that are lost. They said, Well, nothing's happened to me. You know, I'm not I'm not worried about hell. I don't I don't feel the fires of hell now. I don't I don't have uh, the devil standing next to me and so forth. I've talked to Josh the other day when we were out soul went into knocking on doors and like I said this morning we tried to give him the gospel. And he says, You know what? You know, I've never been to a physical hell, but I tell you what, I felt hell on this earth and I don't like it. And, you know, we try to give them the gospel, and again, we're going to go back and follow up with them. Uh, Josh Walker, I want you to pray for him. But he's he's one of those ones who understand that there is a real physical hell, but not everybody uh, will, will acknowledge that. They say, well, I, I'm living a good life. I'm a moral person. I don't have anything to worry about. And they keep putting it off and putting it off, and one day it's going to become a reality for them because hell is a real place. It, the Bible says so. The Apostle Paul was persuaded of the terror of the Lord and we're not safe until we are in the place where the fires have already burned until we're in Jesus. So then we see the, not only the obligation, not only uh, you know, the, being safe and keeping the King's commandments, he has authorization, not only the protection that it offers, but the submission finally Wise men discern time and judgment. Time and judgment is to teach me to submit myself to the ordinance of God's command. Ignorance and violation would only bring misery. But there's a there's a conflict going on. There's, uh, I believe Solomon says here within the next few chapters, he says, look, you think you have all the time in the world. And you don't. You don't know when your day's coming. You don't know when your numbers would be called. You don't know when that death angel is going to show up at your door. Kepler Hawkins were praying for me. He don't know when, when God's going to come for me. He could come before he even makes it to that operation table. Your brother Wayne, Wayne Adams, I pray for him, you know. And, but he don't know when his day's coming. And this is what Solomon is saying. We keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it... Well, I'll I'll worry about that later. Well, you don't know if you have tomorrow. One of the aides came over to... uh, called up uh, President Wilson. Uh, He received a call saying one of his elected officials, he ended up passing away and... He was talking to him, and he says, well, I'm sorry about all this, but, you know, since I got you on the phone, he said, I would love to fill that guy's shoes. And there was silence for a moment, and Woodrow Wilson, he, he says, well, that'd be fine with me, but he's, you better check with the undertaker to make sure it's okay with, him, with you taking this place, you know? You know, we, 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 we can't let somebody... The only other person who could take our place in death was Jesus Christ. But Adams, you can't take my place and give me a few extra years. We can't, I, can't, I can't let anybody else take my place and so I can live a little bit longer No one God comes calling. That's it. But to keep putting it off. And keep putting it off and putting it off. And the question is... Or you be ready? Are you ready when the time comes when, when, when God comes calling you home? I come down to the end and I'm just I want to skip down through here. But it looks here toward the end and, and it says, There's a vanity which is done upon the earth, verse 14, that there is a just man unto whom it happeneth according to the work of the wicked. Again, there be wicked men to whom it happeneth according to the work of the righteous. And I said this is also vanity and, and on and on. And pretty much down there through there, what it's saying for us is, you know, it don't matter if you're righteous or unrighteous. Because you've been righteous doesn't guarantee you a long life. Because you've been unrighteous doesn't mean that you, your life is really going to be cut short, but you don't know when that time is coming. But you're going to answer to God one day. One day there is a judgment coming. Just like if you violate the king's command, there's going to be a judgment coming. 
But the greater judgment is not banishment from a kingdom. The greater judgment is banishing from, from the presence of God to be banished into a place called hell. And so here they try to wake them up because they, they're trying to figure out the works of God. You know, they try to figure out everything concerning God. Well, I wonder, I wonder how all this is going to work out. You, you see that there in verse 17. Then I beheld all the work of God that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. I said, stop trying to figure it out. Your responsibility is not to try to figure out, hey, how does this work and, and what are the loopholes and, 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 and try to figure out everything that God is. You're not going to figure it out. Your only responsibility is to accept Christ as your Savior. Your only responsibility is to submit to the ordinances of God and to enjoy, as it says in verse 16, enjoy that which God has given to us. That's the only responsibility. Sometimes I think that, you know, we think, well, I pointed out to Josh, you know, we think that, well, since I'm saved, I can live any way that I want to. That's what most of the world thinks. You know, the Apostle Paul tells him in the book of Romans, shall I continue in sin that grace may abound? What did he say? God forbid. And just because we're saved doesn't mean that we can escape God chastising, God's punishment on the fact that we say, well, I'm saved, no, I'm not worried about a thing. No. You might think you, it's like my mom used to say, you got to come home sometime. <laughs> We might try to run for a while. Guys want to get us. Our, our responsibility is you know, to, to live in God's house the way that we ought to live as His children. To walk worthy of the Lord. To walk worthy of our vocation. To live for the Lord. I mean, it talks about several other ways that we're ought, we ought to walk as His children. Watching our mouth. Watching the way that we walk. Watching our thoughts. Watching our heart. Keeping a guard over top of our heart. Because there's a, I mean, as a saved person, I want to face the great white throne judgment. I'm thankful for that. Aren't you thankful for that, Savannah? But there's another judgment, isn't there? The judgment seat of Christ. You know what? I, I can't answer for you, and I can't really answer for myself. I know one day when I see the Lord, I'm probably going to be scared and trembling. I want to be like the Apostle John. I probably want to fall flat on my face and say, Lord, I'm sorry I tried to live the best way that I could. But sometimes that's the problem. We try the best way we can instead of relying upon God. Relying upon the Spirit. We try to do it in the arm of our own flesh. Instead of letting God do the work in us, staying in His Word. But here, the, we're encouraged to enjoy what God has given to us. Submit to the ordinance of God. Submit to His commands. Just submit ourselves unto God. That's, that's our instruction tonight. And that's what I challenge you with. Are you submitting to God? Because there's somebody more real than the President of the United States. There's somebody more real than the King. There's somebody more real than the police officers that guard us. And you know what? He, he has fair, ju- fair judgment. He will execute righteousness. He doesn't have a bias. He doesn't have... Well, he has an opinion and there's a right opinion of us. But His judgment's always right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank You for these here tonight. I pray You would do a work within our hearts. Lord, I ask You to help us to be submissive unto You. Lord, there's times where I know that uh, I, there's times where we haven't walked worthy of You. There's times where we've rebelled and walked away. And Lord, I pray You help us to keep a guard on our steps to walk circumspectly. Lord, You've given us a great commission to go out and share the Gospel. You've given us Your Word to live by. And I pray You help us to do that by Your Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're not going to give an invitation tonight. I know your testimony. You say you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And the only way to be saved is by faith. 
And I don't know if you're saved. Only you know that. Only you know that. But I pray that you are. You've heard the Gospel enough times to, to know better. But let us walk worthy of our Lord. Brother Coon, would you dismiss us in a word of prayer?